John, thank you very much for a nice introduction. And I also would like to thank you to all of our participants for joining up this live webinar this evening. So I hope you can all see my screen now. Okay. That's great. Glad well, we can see you. Good. Great. So So today I'm going to talk about the water option, gas absorption measurements on molds. So briefly during this talk, I would like to talk about uh, I will give introduction to absorption science. Then I will focus on water and CO2 absorption measurements on uh, magnesium of 74 and functional of 74. I also would like to give examples of strontium uh, for toxic gases absorption. So we will show example of uh, SO2 absorption at 25 degrees and also cycling experiments. And lastly, I will show example of the binary uh, co-absorption of water CO2 on one of the materials. Uh, so there is several characterization methods to characterize the metal organic frameworks. So as I as John mentioned, so in the past I used the energy, so in particular X-rays, I did lots of X-ray absorption spectroscopy and X-ray diffraction to look at the structure of the materials. We can also use the heat, so in particular calorimetry or TGAs to look at the materials and behavior. But the interior stocks, we would like to focus on uh, matter on uh, molecules as a probe. So in this way, we're going to look at the absorption technique and which will provide information about thermodynamics, uh, chemical and the structure. So we use the matter to probe study of uh, materials. So some of you wonder why we would use uh, probes as a molecules to characterize, uh, characterize metal organic frameworks. One of, the, one of the main benefits is that we can actually study molds under real conditions. And this goes back to uh, origin when the mold was first introduced, and there were really promising applications. And when the industry started using the molds, they soon, soon after they found out that actually molds are not stable under uh, real conditions, to mean uh, ambient temperatures and the vacuum, so they need to be kept in the specific conditions. So one of the reason is now to offer the actual measurements, we can actually look at the stability of molds, in particular in the presence of humidity, which is very critical for stability of these materials, and also when they expose less to CO2. So we don't want the molds to change the structures. So the probe molecules provide information about the ambient and high temperatures. So we can uh, look at these, also phase equilibrium and study dynamic processes. So vapor absorption can occur in the several bases. So we can have it on the surface. So we can have a surface absorption, which is typical with very low absorption, very low, uh, let's say very low uptake. It can become in the pores. We can do the between the particles. So when then we observe the condensation, then it can be in the pores or micro pores, or some of the molecules can be absorbed into the bar, or there will be chemical reactions and they can form the hydrates. When the probes react with the solid surface, they can get either weakly adopt to the surface or can, they can penetrate into the bulk of the materials and so the rest of the molecules coming out of the absorption process. These processes of interaction of molecules with the solid surface can be, can be described by absorption or an absorption. When we talk about the absorption processes, we always refer to physics absorption and chemical absorption processes. And in terms of absorption, we refer to bulk absorption. So materials goes into the bulk of the materials or into the lattice structure within, uh, in which where it can form different, uh, 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 where it can uh, form the, let's say, solvents. In this talk, we only focus on the physics absorption process. We're not going to, so physics absorption process, it can be described by weakly absorbed molecules. And it can be, Physically, weakly as the molecules can be regenerated. When we talk about chemical absorption, the molecules actually react 
with the bonds of the materials, and they can transfer from one species to the other species. So we can from so what the uh, other question is like what can actually learn from these uh, vapor gas absorption measurements? One of the most important answers from these measurements is the stability of the moles in the presence of water or CO2. And it was demonstrated by several researchers, let's say from Georgia Tech, that actually, and also by Stefan Gaskell, that actually stability of moles is critical for development of storage of these materials because some of the moles collapse when they were exposed to the water, or some of the moles actually change the curve structure chemically when they expose a small amount of CO2, let's say from the air. We can also obtain information of, about the total gas, gas absorption capacities at different temperatures. And uh, so if you call it, let's say, isotherms in a broad temperature range, we can obtain information about the heat of absorption. We can, uh, we can look at the absorption at very low concentrations, we think about the PPM levels. So this is important for carbon capture or removal of volatile organic uh, compounds from the air. We can also look at the uh, information about the kinetics. So we want to calculate diffusion coefficients. So we want to know how fast these uh, molecules can be absorbed by moles. And it also provides information about these vapor and gas solid interactions. And lastly, we can uh, calculate which is uh, a surface, uh, uh, surface area of these materials if you use a liquid nitrogen, which is most common techniques to actually determine. So, so the interaction of a solid or moles with a vapor molecule can be described by the adsorption isotherms. So the adsorption isotherm is basically a relationship between uh, the amount of vapor gas absorbed at uh, different uh, equilibrium pressures at a constant temperature. Yeah. So on the right hand side, we have the picture of water absorption isotherms on our carbon at 25 degrees. What we see here, we have the two cycles. So we have the adsorption branch, which is uh, shown by green and red line, and the desorption branch, which is shown by solid pink and blue line. So what we see on x-axis, we have a relative pressure, which is described as a P or P naught. So P naught is a saturation pressure of absorbed at operation temperature. On y-axis, we have a change in the mass or the amount of absorbed. So what we see here, so during the absorption process, we actually step up the concentration of the molecules. And as a result, the amount of the gas absorbed or vapors in this case uh, goes up. So the sample is gaining mass. On the desorption branch, we actually step down the amount of the vapor molecules and the weight can go down. Now the, gis, the hysteresis is basically the gap what you, what you see here is called hysteresis. Basically, that's the difference between the adsorption and the desorption isotherms. Now, during these uh, adsorption phenomena, several processes uh, occur. So you have the monolayer adsorption, you can have the multilayer adsorption, condensation, bulk adsorption, and uh, hydration reaction. So here we look at the type 4 isotherms, which is uh, can be described by Multiple absorption, but also the condensation in the pores, which is demonstrated by huge hysteresis in the pores. Now, the group, the adsorption isotherms, can be grouped into the uh, IUPAC uh, classification into the six main groups. So you can have uh, one for macroporous, non porous, and weak substrate, mesoporous, and uh, layering. Now, there was also a new grouping. Uh, released recently by Matthias Thomas and co-workers, where they go more into the detail and explain different interaction of these uh, vapors or gas molecules with the solids. So typically, we look usually for the most, we look at the type 5 isotherms or type 3, depending on the chemistry, how it was uh, dissolved. So microporos are usually typical zeolites, so they have the finite absorption. A type 4 is described by the capillary condensation. We're not going to describe all of them. Now, how we can actually collect the adsorption isotherm? So there are two main uh, techniques to actually collect, to obtain the adsorption isotherm. So one is the volumetric gas adsorption apparatus. So basically, historically, adsorption isotherms were collected using a volumetric method. Spore molecules in liquid nitrogen. 
And from this data is very powerful data which give information about the porosity and also about the surface area. So it is one of the go-to techniques to kind of obtain, let's say, the surface area and uh, pore volume of the materials. The other way to obtain the adsorption isotherms is uh, gravimetric gas vapor adsorption apparatus, which will be shown in this talk. And this is basically complementary to volumetric system, but is mainly focused on actually understanding or behavior of these materials under more realistic conditions. So when you want to use these materials in the real applications, so once you've done your porosity characterization, then you should go for the gravimetric vapor absorption analysis to understand how these materials can behave in the real conditions, how much can be how it can be used for the gas absorption or other applications. In this talk, we focus on the vacuum gravimetric absorption analyzer. And the reason is because modes or coats of zeolite, they need our extensive outgassing, which is not always possible using traditional methods like the flowing of, nit flowing of nitrogen at high temperatures. Also, the system guarantees a clean environment for air sensitive uh, or moisture sensitive samples. And as I mentioned, this was already demonstrated that in our apparatus, we can do in situ outgassing and regeneration of the samples. And which is actually very powerful. So we don't, once you load the sample into your analyzer, you don't have to remove it so you can get the data in situ. Also, when we do water vapors option, there is no carrier gas. So driving force, so the vapors like water organic vapors, if you start the VOCs, are generated by liquid itself at thermodynamic equilibrium at experimental temperature. So the driving force for the molecule is actually vacuum, which is actually pulled from the flask into the system and then in order to get them into direct contact with the solid material. And this gives us understanding of the pore structure of these uh, materials, in particular the pore size area, so we, we can actually allow the molecules small enough to go into the pores or the cages of these uh, materials. And this help, help us to actually design uh, better in the industrial processes. And lastly, it actually allows, so this is dynamic method. It allows us to reach the equilibrium very fast, which is demonstrated even compared to static or dynamic ambient pressure. So you get much faster to run the vacuum. So how dynamic vapor absorption or DVS uh, works? Typically, as you would expect, you load, like in your, let's say, thermogravimetric analyzer sample into the uh, metal pan. So it, it can be either your powder or granules. And in your first stage of all these measurements, either the volumetric or gravimetric is outgassing of the material under high temperature, high vacuum. So for this, we close the upstream. We pull high vacuum, 10 minus 6 millibar, high temperature and we completely clean the pores or cages of the materials. Once we remove all the, once the materials is out gas, then the sample is cooled down to the option temperature. And uh, then we introduce pro molecules using our mass flow controllers. So for these, we close the downstream, open the mass flow upstream, and we introduce pro molecule interest, either water or CO2. And then we wait for the interaction of this pro molecule with the sample. And when we reach the steady state, we're gonna get a constant flux or water or gases over the molecule, over the sample in order to reach nice mass equilibrium. If you look at the right hand side, so I'm showing some graphs. So basically on y x axis, we have the time and y axis is the weight of the sample. So data here, solid red line is the mass of the sample. Solid blue line is a uh, relative pressure. So what we see here, as I described, so initially the material is outgassed. So this sample lost by weight 5% during the outgassing sample, outgassing stage. Then we introduce water vapor in the control model at very low concentration, about 0.1% POP node RH. And we wait for the mass equilibrium. So the mass equilibrium is, is actually uh, solid red line, which, which you're reaching actually the plateau. And during the mass equilibrium, and once the mass equilibrium was reached, they moved to the next or higher relative uh, pressure step. So as you step up the relative pressure, we're observing the gain in the mass all the way up to 90%. And when we step down the relative pressure, we observe mass loss. And from the equilibrium pressure points, 
from the equilibrium mass data points, we can calculate the adsorption isotherm, which is shown here, where we actually compare the, where we plot change or mass gain or weight against the different relative pressures. So this is the typical absorption behavior of uh, zeolites. When we observe small hysteresis gap due to the condensation uh, in the pores, because the material remains on the clay and there's the condensation of desorption. So if the absorption is option, it can be described by nicely by type one isotherms and 50 day pattern builds, let's say, can be by real side lung mirror or lung mirror isotherm. So this is typical basic principle of DVS. So what it looks like, on the right hand side, we have the picture of uh, DVS vacuum. So you have a set of the pumps, which serves as the basically force to pull your molecules and also for outgassing. He has got the temperature enclosure. So the temperature enclosure defines your, uh, your absorption temperature. So we can generate the vapors in the temperature range 20 to 70 degrees up to 90% pure P0. Then we also have a high temperature preheater around the sample where we can go out gas the materials up to 400 degrees, but we can also perform the adsorption, let's say water vapor up to 150, the gas up to 400 uh, degrees adsorption. And what you can see here is a small flask. This is where you're going to put your water organic solvent. The right hand side is just basically scheme. And I'm going to spend a couple of minutes on this because, especially for co adsorption, so this system allows you to do two vapors, two gases, or one vapor, one gas. For this, we have the two muscle controllers, which are used to deliver vapors and gases to the sample. And when the vapor or gas enter the vacuum chamber, it's equally split over the sample side and the reference side. Okay. So what we see here, this is the vacuum chamber. Under dome here, we have ultra balance. So it is symmetrical balance. And the front balance beam is suspended to hang down wires, one on the sample side, one on the left, one on the right, for sample reference side. On the exit side, we have a butterfly valve, which actually controls the resistance type or amount of molecules inside the vacuum chamber in dynamic mode. Oh, and on the exit side of the valve, we have the uh, sets of the pumps. Now, the pressure is directly measured by two parathrons, center and thousand tor. So this is a typical setup, which allows you to work in dynamic mode and also in the static mode. Basically, in the static mode, this valve is always closed. And it will work like in the in the case of volumetric systems that uh, we use uh, mass flow controllers to inject the amount of water or gas molecule into the chamber, and then we wait for the mass equilibrium. So I mean, the pressure drop, drop below the pressure we're going to refill it. Now, these are the insights of the picture of the vacuum state, and what I'm going to show you setup, especially for power cards option. So what can you do? This system allows you to study water and CO2. So it allows you to do water, pure water absorption isotherms. It allows you pure CO2 absorption isotherms. But I also I can mix these two uh, pro molecules together and perform both CO2 in dynamic mode and the static mode. So what you see, the sample is sitting here on the left hand side. Now, to get access to the sample, you under these two clumps, this drops down, and you can get access like in TGA to do metal fan. So this is very important. And as you can see, this is also inside the temperature control enclosure. We call it incubator, or imagine it's like oven, which control precisely the temperature. We don't have an issue with the condensation, but it also is defined, is used to actually generate the vapors in this, uh, this temperature. Now, as I mentioned, so there's two operation modes, one is dynamic mode. And the benefit is when we can go very low absolute pressures, so we can go down to five millitons. So it, this allows you to do, let's say, water absorption at 60 degrees at 0.02% RH. We can do single dual component absorption and uh, also resistance control. The static mode, which is powerful mode, if you have right type of moves to study actually the co-absorption processes at the constant loading of, uh, let's say, constant loading of the water vapor. Now let's move to applications. So one of the first applications is going to be going to look at the water vapor and isotherms and CO2 adsorption isotherms up to one bar on MOS. So, and this is very useful for current uh, uh, <clears throat> climate. So basically, there is a huge interest to study the carbon capture. There is a rise of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. 
and which is a major factor for increased uh, global surface temperature. As you can see, the trajectory is, is uh, if you are not going to do something about it, it's, it's going to keep going up. So for this, there is a need to actually develop the processes or technologies to reduce CO2 in the atmosphere. So there is already several processes considered, like, I mean, scrubbing technologies for CO2 capture and sequestration, direct air capture for CO2 capture from the air. There are already some uh, commercial devices available. Or in this talk, we're going to focus mainly on adsorption-based processes using the MOS, operating in the pressure and temperature extreme modes. So this is the most interesting for us. So today we're going to look at the MOFs. So there was a lot of excellent work which give introduction to the MOFs. And I just want to highlight benefits why we want to study MOFs for CO2 capture because of their very high surface area. And then, and mainly because they, the ability to actually to study to the tune the pore structure of the materials. So these are the most power, powerful techniques for the MOFs. So in this, uh, Work. We're going to function. Uh, we're going to focus now on magnesium MOF 724, which was actually one of the first reported for CO2 capture because it's got higher adsorption capacity. And what we want to do, we want to increase the amount of uh, uh, amine units available for CO2 adsorption by actually by functionalizing this uh, magnesium MOF 74 using tesla and pentaamine. And the aim of this work, what I'm going to talk today, is actually so we're going to focus on what is CO2 adsorption measurement and co-adsorption measurements. First, before I go further, I would like to highlight one of the things I'm going to talk about is like what is option, as I mentioned in my talk, but I also want to show the effect about gassing. Okay, so one of the powerful things about DVS is that they can actually monitor in, in real time the outgassing of the material. So here we look at one of the moths, which was initially outgassed using only high vacuum, 10 minus 6 torr. As you can see, you get certain mass, mass loads. And drying curve suggests the material is already outgassed. And what would you do now? You would introduce your problem like you will start collecting isotopes. Now, but what you can see, I increase the temperature using the preheat to 150 degrees. As a result, my mass loss is actually much higher. And this suggests the material was not completely outgassed. But the reason I mentioned this is actually is very simple because the outgassing of the materials has a huge effect on adsorption capacity and also the stability of the material. And the reason is you can, if you outgas at very quite low temperatures, your adsorption capacity might be too low. If you go outgas materials at high temperature, especially in uh, metal organic frameworks, you might destroy the structure. So in our case, we have to using this high this vacuum type uh, preheater to actually these materials. So we will be going to look at the outgassing of uh, temperature on the MOF 74 for water absorption isotherm. So here's a kinetic plot. So we're basically what we're looking here, we're looking at this plot at outgassing some of uh, MOF 74 at 150 degrees. So as you can see, is a huge mass loss, almost 55, 8%. And we get nice plateau. And then in a control manner, we introduce water vapor which is demonstrated by this solid blue line. When you step up the pressure up to 90% POP naught, and then we wait at each stage for mass equilibrium. And from this equilibrium points, then we construct the isotope. Now, what you observe here, so if you outgas this magnesium of 74 or 150 degrees, you get a huge adsorption capacity. And uh, compared to MOF outgas at uh, Let's say 250, uh, 250 degrees, which is shown in line green. So basically, what you see, first striking observation is that the MOFs outgas at 250 degrees suggest that the structure was a little bit distorted or collapsed because the adsorption capacity is much lower. And also, the desorption, when we perform the desorption steps, Lots of water gets trapped inside the matrix of the material, so water is not coming out. Whereas, that if the material is outgassed at 150 degrees, the adsorption capacity is higher, but also the absorption of molecules is uh, much, much more of the water molecules coming out of the material. Now, we've done the same work uh, on this functionalized MOF 74 at 25. So, again, we've done the outgassing 120. 
150 and 250 degrees. And we see a relatively different absorption behavior. So we again look at the kinetics of dimensions so we can calculate basically the fusion coefficients, how the fast motor goes into the molecules. So we again step up the pressure from zero to 90 and we go back to zero. So as you see the nice equilibriums. And again, what we see, again, the huge effect on outgassing where you actually see the functionalized moles got much smaller hysteresis gap. So the adsorption branch is shown in uh, green, desorption in the pink. So the gap is very small, very similar to, let's say, what you get for like uh, some zeolite shape uh, these uh, clays materials compared to, compared to same material outgas at 250 degrees. Again, we see huge hysteresis gaps, water is not coming out of the materials. So the actually structure of material was usually affected by the outgassing of the conditions. So the message from this is outgassing of the moles is very important, but is also very critical, the choice of the temperature of the, for the outgassing of the materials. Basically, as, I can, as you can see here, you can see, you can get very different adoption capacities for the same material, depending on outgassing temperature. I would like to mention not too many researchers mention the outgassing conditions and the temperatures, because then it's very difficult to compare from one moth to the another, because if it didn't start it from the same starting point. Now, this moth also now we can employ, let's say, modeling. So we can use the Langmuir to feed the data, and we can get a Langmuir constant. So we can do modeling. So we also look at the adoption capacity of moths using the CO2. So now I'm not going to go into the kinetics. As you can see, if you go to functionalized moths with much higher adoption capacity compared to original moths 74 for CO2. So we look at the CO2 adoption isotherms after one bar. Now, we also actually, again, we look into more in details. So first, we look at the moths 74 uh, outgassing capacity. So basically, you get about 16% uptake. Now, when you have the excess of the amine, which is demonstrated by uh, so this green line, and outgassing as 150 and 115, we get much lower. So basically, if you fully saturate this more 74 with the amines, your adsorption capacity for CO2 is very low. I mean, one would expect that it might go up when you put more amine side, you might see create more of the CO2 side, but that's not the case. But then, if you have actually less than 1% amine and you use the same outgassing conditions, what we demonstrated here, your actually adsorption capacity usually improve by a factor of six. So in this case, we get almost a 28% adsorption capacity compared to 48% when you have excess of the amine. So as you can see, again, so the effect of outgassing and the functionalization of the mold is huge depending how you prepare your material, how you go out with your material. So now we're going to move to the co-adoption measurement in dynamic mode. So the way we done this, I will show. So we flow over the sample mixture of water CO2, and we went up to 23 tor. And then we look at the effects so look at the kinetics, and then we can look at the effects of water CO2 mixture. So for these mixtures, we see on this lower slide improvements for functionalized moths, as is demonstrated by the isotherms here at the bottom. So it's very difficult to comment. But the effect, the improvements we see when you have the mixture two to one water, CO2 water, for co-adsorption, that actually functionalized more does not show, uh, shows that the sum of the water or CO2 does not stay uh, inside the matrix of the material compared to original MOF 74, where we see observing the hysteresis gap. So the conclusion is actually that Functionalization improve the accessibility of CO2 for accessibility CO2, but also improve the water uh, performance. Or is, or it improve also the CO2 adoption capacity of water in the presence of water if you use only one percent of amines. If you use saturate completed uh, morph of these amines, then actually some of the CO2 side will be excluded from the adsorption process. My next application will be adsorption of toxic gassing of moths. So here, I'm going to look at the MFM 300 moths, which was actually prepared by the Javara group from UNAM in Mexico. And we want to focus on uh, SO2 adsorption at 25 degrees up to one bar. So once again, the materials was outgas at 25 degrees. 
And uh, so you can see you get the beautiful uh, mass equilibriums at the different uh, pressure steps when we step the pressure of CO2. So we use the pure CO2. So we go from very low concentrations up to 100% CO2 at the one bar. And what we observe is we actually make a nice style of one of the isotherms here. And the adoption capacity for of this more like 9.4 millimole per gram. But now we also look at the well, as I said, the stability of the material and the cycling or adoption performance is very important as well as regeneration capacity. So what we've done here, so basically we cycle this uh, MFM MFM, MFM uh, 300 scandium modes at under high vacuum. So regeneration was done. 10 minus 6 uh, tor for 30 minutes, and then we introduced pure SO2, and we've done the 10 cycles. And as you can see, the adsorption uh, capacity of this uh, MMF mode does not change. So the capacity same is in 9.545 plus minus 0.15 millimole per gram. So it's only good to a resource. So mode is very stable for in the presence of toxic gases, and it remains actually is retained its adsorption capacity. You can do similar studies using, let's say, mil 101. So in this case, we can keep the water pressure constant at 5.6 kilopascal. And then we just vary the temperature of the sample between 14 and 140 degrees. And as you can see, after 20 cycles, the adoption capacity of most goes down with a number of cycles. So this is one of the reasons the zero are still more use in an industrial scale because the adsorption capacity doesn't change with the number of adsorption uh, cycles. And lastly, I would like to introduce you about the binary competitive adsorption of CO2 at constant loading of water vapor. On the, in this case, I'm going to show the same sample of zero life in order to quantify the amount of which adsorption molecules. So what I will talk you through now is very simple experiment which can be done in the static mode in our DVS. So basically, First stage is outgassing of the materials, high temperature, high vacuum. Then you leave the material equilibrium at constant uh, uh, pressure of water vapor. So in this case, we use 1.845 volume percent of water vapor. We wait for the mass equilibrium. When the mass equilibrium is reached, I bring CO2 and smoke on top of its CO2 in small concentration by using second MFC and wait for mass equilibrium again. And now from this data, if I subtract my initial water uptake, I can actually calculate CO2 adsorption capacity. And we can obtain this kind of the graph, which tells you that at constant loading water vapor, at 1.845 volume percent of water, I can get about 10 volume, uh, 10 weight percent of the CO2. So this powerful method, which can be used for certain MOFs, as long as they have the correct uh, chemistry, because there are a few assumptions we have made, the water cannot replace the CO2, and there are no interaction actually CO2 with the material. So we don't want to have any chemical option taking the place. Now, this brings me to the end of my talks. So as you can see, the DVS is very useful, a powerful method for obtaining single components and uh, multi-component adsorption isotherm at different temperatures. And also for studying the water absorption and gas absorption isotherms. So if you employ, comply the DVS method with uh, uh, Simulation techniques like IST, you can get a powerful data sets for designing of the industrial processes. So last, I would like to thank you to my collaborators, uh, Professor Dara Williams from Imperial College London, uh, Alan Hatton, Leif Bromberg, and Akshay Aksu from MIT, and uh, also Ilich Barra and Jorge Balfanda from UNAM for help with the IST simulations. And also, if you, are, if you are interested, I would like to invite you to our tomorrow session when I'm going to uh, talk about the design of automatic experiments in DVS using DVS vacuum control software. And you can see how we can easily set up this kind of experiment or study of uh, metal, organic, metal organic frameworks. Now, thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, please, is the time, the floor is open for the questions. Uh, thank you for. Oh. Thank you for a great uh, presentation there, Vladimir. Um, do you think we have some time to answer a few of the questions in the chat?
Yes, we have a time to ask a few questions. If you guys, if you, I'm very happy to answer. If it's not too okay, late. Okay, great. Uh, there's been several questions submitted, so if you just have a look in the chat scroll, you'll be able to see them labelled uh, if you just want to address them there. Okay. Okay, so we have a question from Victoria Kulaova. Uh, her question is, does co-adsorption H2CO2 measurements using DVS requires first pre-saturation of sample with water vapor and then CO2 absorption? That's correct. You actually got it right. So in this example, I show two examples in my last example. In my last example in the starting mode, basically, as you described, I need a pre-saturation with water vapor, and then I pre-introduce the CO2 on top, top of it. Also, your second question was whether I can feed water and CO2 at the same time. That's the correct. So in my previous example, I am able to feed water and CO2 at the same time. But now, when we do this, the challenge is, and I can control pressure inside the chamber. That's not the problem. The challenge is when we feed both water and CO2 at the same time and maintain the pressure is to actually uh, quantify the amount of water and CO2 at all, because we can measure, so this is a gravimetric met method, and we measure only one mass. So I can't tell from the mass data how much water CO2 is all. So for this, in order to quantify it, we have to either enter IST. So we use the simulation techniques to actually determine the amount of water and CO2 absorbed. And then we compare this data with real experimental data. Or the other option is we are looking at it together with our collaborators and NASA that we, you know, we would like to edit up, let's say, FDRI to actually quantify it in the real time. So we need some another detector to do this. So the other question is from uh, Daniel Dudu. So how do you deal with selectivity, permeability, trade-offs? And therefore, in the effect and efficient separation of CO2, uh, this is very good uh, question. So in terms of the selectivity, the way we deal in our case is we look at the structure of the materials and we look at the opening, like in the simple example, one of the simplest way to look at it is basically, we look at the structure and the uh, opening of the cages of the pores, pores, and then we look at the kinetic diameter of the pro molecules. And a simple way to do it, if you have the two, if you have the pro molecules, which have a huge kinetic diameter, so they might be too big to go inside to the pores. So, there's one of the one, one way to actually deal with the selectivity. Basically, if the pore is if the molecule is too big to go into the pore, so it's going to be excluded from the adsorption process. If it's small enough, or the pore or the pro molecule is uh, the uh, kinetic diameter is uh, similar to the pore size, so they in that case are going to go straight into the pore. So we're going to get the huge adsorption. Uh, uh, adoption uptake. So it's, it's very challenging in the process for us to actually determine the selectivity and separation. Again, if you want to look at the separation, we have to employ the, again, the simulation techniques to actually look more into the detail. But a simple way would be just look at the chemistry of the materials and the kinetic development of the materials to look at it physically, but it's actually going to be excluded from the adsorption process or not. Also, the other question is from, uh, sorry if I can pronounce it wrongly, from Payman Moghadam. Can you also perform the adsorption of toxic chemicals, sulfur capture? Uh, yes. You can uh, perform the adsorption of the uh, sulfur, uh, sulfur chemical, toxic chemicals. So we can perform the H2S adsorption, we can do SO2 adsorption as I showed in my examples, and we can do also the ammonia adsorption. So we can perform all these measurements in our system.
Okay, fantastic. I think that's all the questions we have, uh, Vladimir. Um, is there anything you'd like to add at the end? Uh, yes, so thanks. I would like to thank all our attendees for listening in to today's webinar. And if they have any questions, please don't hesitate to email me or contact us. We are also open for collaboration. So if you would like to perform some measurements, so we are ha I'm happy to do it for you. So please keep in touch and uh, don't hesitate to get in touch with us. We are here ready to help you and help you with your measurements. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vladimir. I'm sure everyone will uh, join me in thanking you for a fantastic presentation. Um, we would like to now announce the winner of our raffle. This is uh, the giveaway offer we've been running through our MOF app. And this is for the free sample analysis of up to five samples. So thank you all for submitting, if any of you are listening in. And uh, the winner of our giveaway has been announced as Patrick Fritz from the University of Fribourg. So we will be contacting Patrick to, uh, to arrange that. So congratulations to Patrick. I would also like to, uh, to invite you all to, uh, to attend our live product demonstration tomorrow at um, 4.25 European time. Uh, this is to demonstrate our control, our control software, a fantastic, uh, a fantastic program we use to, to design, plan, and automatically run experiments. So it's a fantastic tool for laboratories, especially those running long form experiments. So we invite you to join us all and uh, find the location for that on our MOF, on the MOF portal app and uh, join us tomorrow at the, uh, the afternoon networking session. Uh, I would also like to invite anyone who has any questions or any queries or who does like to, to uh, get in contact, to contact any of the surface measurement team through the MOF portal app. Uh, I'd like to thank you all again, all once again for joining us. And I hope you really have a lovely evening and we look forward to speaking to you further. Thank you all.